Hello and welcome to my video presentation, where I will demonstrate and discuss the Earth Init project that I've been working on. I began this project with Associate Professor Patrice Ray from the School of Geosciences, which later became my capstone project for the Masters of Complex Systems. We later began collaborating with Dr. Tristan Sales, combining our coding projects together. According to the theory of plate tectonics, the lithosphere, also known as the crust, is a solid rock surface of the earth that floats above the mantle, which behaves like a liquid when considered over geological time scales. The crust is broken into chunks called plates which slowly move over time due to convection currents in the mantle. As these plates move, their boundaries can either converge, colliding into each other, diverge, moving away from each other, or transform, sliding past each other. Plate tectonics can be considered as a complex system because there are many interacting forces involved in their dynamics, along with many interacting particles with different properties, due to their chemical compositions, densities, pressures, temperature, and many others. Although many computational models of plate tectonics exist, many attempt to be physically accurate, making them too computationally demanding to simulate on a global scale. In our work, instead of simulating the underlying physics of plate tectonics, we attempt to estimate the emergent properties that result. Our work focuses on simulating only the final surface topology without directly considering the underlying forces. Our resulting simulations are best visualized on spherical meshes, and this animation is an example of what can be produced by our code. Here the simulation runs from 200 million years ago until present day, with a time step of 2 million years. We can clearly see continents breaking and drifting apart due to moving tectonic plates. To initialize our simulation, we begin by reading data provided by Scottes and Wright which contains height map data of Earth's historic topography at various points in time. We then use spherical polar coordinate transformations to convert the data from longitudinal and latitudinal coordinates into Cartesian XYZ coordinates. We can then use these coordinates to build a spherical mesh in Pi Vista, where we exaggerate the terrain for visualizational purposes. To then move the plates along the surface of the sphere, we use historic data from Matthews and Owl, which is specifically designed to be compatible with G-plates. A Python interface then allows us to use G-plates within a script, which we use to define plates and their movements. We assign each vertex on a sphere an integer plate ID number to identify which plate it belongs to and we then use rotational quaternions to move vertices on a given plate along the surface of our sphere. This then leads to a problem of having a broken mesh, with missing vertices in some regions and overlapping vertices in others. To solve this issue, we use the grid data interpolation scheme provided by the Python sklearn library to interpolate heights back onto our original longitudinal and latitudinal coordinates. This causes another problem at the converging plate boundaries where vertices overlap. Our mountain ranges are disappearing. We want our interpolator to ignore subducting vertices and only sample from the overriding plates. To solve this issue, we represent our vertices as a cylindrical point cloud, where the height of the cylinder is chosen to be such that the vertices are otherwise equally spaced apart. This allows us to use the DB scan clustering algorithm from sklearn to identify overlapping vertices, after which we set their height to the maximum of their nearest neighbors. 
This has a side effect of mountains growing at the subduction boundaries, which happens in real life anyways. To trigger various tectonic activity, we need to keep track of the plate boundaries. We read the location and details of plate boundaries from PyG plates and store them as Python objects. An essential piece of information that is not provided to us is the speed and angle at which the tectonic plates collide at every point of the boundary. For a given point, we can calculate this by applying the rotation quaternions from both plates on either sides of the points, and measure the distance that they have moved in a single iteration with a known time step. This lets us calculate the velocity of the collision, and we can figure out the angle that this velocity makes with the plate boundary. We then need to identify if the plates are converging or diverging. To do so, we apply our rotations to the plate centers and see if they move towards or away from each other. In the image shown here, upwards pointing arrows represent colliding boundaries and downwards pointing arrows represent diverging boundaries. The size of each arrow represents the magnitude of collision and the red bars show their directions. We will also be needing to perform many distance calculations and we have two differing methods to do so. The first method is based on the KD tree algorithm which helps us identify which k number of points on our plates are the closest to a given vertex. This is however not ideal for the actual distance calculations because it treats the boundary as a set of points rather than a continuous line, resulting in a distance field looking like a stitching pattern as illustrated in the figure to the left. We use the SciPy library for this task. The second method is based on PyVista's ray tracing algorithm. Here we convert our boundary into a thin set of tubular meshes and use PyVista to calculate the distance between the surfaces of the tubes and the earth meshes. This gives much more accurate distance calculations but does not tell us which particular point on our boundary is the closest point. Once we know the distance that vertices are to the boundaries and the velocities of its nearest boundary points, we can use this information to calculate the subduction uplift. Subduction occurs when two plates collide and the less dense plate plunges underneath the more dense plate. This causes mountains to grow on the overriding plate. To calculate the distance contribution to subduction, we can only use distances that vertices from subduction boundaries that it is overriding on. To relate the distance uplift, we choose the skewed Gaussian distribution as our distance transfer. The effective range of our distance transfer is modulated by the angle of collision. To calculate the speed contribution, we average the collision speeds of the closest k plate boundary points to get our speed transfer. Multiplying the speeds and distances together we can get an uplift map for this particular iteration. The general speed of mountain growth can be controlled by adding a base uplift coefficient to the uplift map. When two continents diverge away from each other we need them to leave oceans behind. To implement this, we use the distances that vertices are from diverging boundaries and their heights with respect to sea level. We choose the distance function to be Gaussian so that points closer to the boundary are lowered more than points further away. We choose the height transfer function to be a sigmoid so that points on continents are lowered significantly more than points in the ocean. It is generally accepted that the depth of deep ocean floors is given by the first equation shown here, where alpha is the age of the floor. As such, we will need to estimate and track the ocean floor age as it progresses over time. To estimate the initial age, we can use the distance that vertices are from mid-oceanic ridges which is a diverging plate boundary in the ocean where floors are newly generated. We can then use the speed of divergence to estimate the age. 
Once we have initialized the floor's age, we update it at each iteration of our simulation based on how much time has passed. We also set the age of floors on continental risk to zero to represent newly generated floors. We can then take advantage of the second equation to update the depth. We only apply this algorithm to vertices that are below a threshold ocean depth. The figure on the right compares depths obtained completely using our method and the heights based on our known data. In the early years of our simulation, we are not given any depth data on ocean floors, so we are entirely dependent on our approximations. Finally, Gospel is a Python framework that simulates various erosion processes on a global scale. It is written by Dr. Tristan Salez, also from our School of Geosciences, and can simulate fluvial erosion due to rain and basin erosion in oceans. We feed the output data of our code to Gospel as tectonic forces and specify constant rain on a global scale. The plot shown here is the resulting water flow accumulation, which moves sediments and thus erodes the terrain. We will now show and discuss various animations of our results. For most simulations, we will use a coarse mesh resolution to avoid having to run the simulation for too long. A clear problem visible is that our terrain begins to smooth out due to our interpolation algorithm. This is less of a problem when we run the simulation with a finer mesh resolution. Another clear problem is that some mountain ranges grow larger or smaller compared to their real counterparts. To solve this issue, we will need to add cross thickness as a vertex parameter that we keep track of and update as the simulation runs. This will allow mountains on thicker plates to grow faster compared to mountains on thinner plates. Our ocean floor algorithm is one of the more successful ones. Our floors seem to resemble present day ocean floors regardless of how long we run our simulation for. Our subduction uplift algorithm, however, does not currently stop mountains from growing too large. We can potentially solve this by taking height into account in our subduction algorithm. Gospel is indeed successful at introducing more detailed terrain due to various erosion processes. We can, however, further tune various Gospel parameters to make it even more compatible with our code. Thank you for watching my presentation. Here are some random images I made throughout the course of this project. Most of these were rendered with Blender, which is no longer my primary tool for this project.